I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. Billy is off today, and but I have joining us um, uh, our own very own uh, forest health specialist, Dr. Ellen Crocker, and she is going to be talking about a new bug. Oh no, I, Ellen. I know, yeah. as if we didn't have enough already. Uh, we have a new invasive insect on the horizon, and joining us today to talk about it, we've got Seth Spinner. Uh, so Seth. Uh, you want to go ahead and share your video join us hello it's great to have you on today so uh today we're going to learn about spotted lanternfly which is your area of expertise we're going to learn yep. about its favorite host plant tree of heaven which i'm going to talk a little bit about because that's a problem whether we have spotted lanternfly or not <laughs> with an invasive <laughs> plant we don't want and then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the interesting projects that you have ways for people to get involved in some of this. I was so, kind of hoping that this bug would take out Tree of Heaven, but it doesn't <laughs> sound like, it's like it's, it's Tree of Choice, but it's not picky on what it eats. Mm -hmm. so, exactly. If only, Renee, if only it just stayed on Tree of Heaven. I was trying. I was like, let's get some hope out of this new insect here. So. <laughs> So, yeah. Well, Seth, I know you're going to kick us off ta talking about what is spotted lanternfly, this new okay. invasive insect that we don't currently have in Kentucky, but it is present in a lot of our neighboring states, and we right. want people to be on the lookout for. Um, so you're going to start us talking about that uh, while you get up your slides. So I'd like to introduce you to everyone, um, because you're the Spotted Lanternfly Outreach Coordinator um, here with the Office of the State Entomologist at the University of Kentucky. And I know that you started your position about a year ago in right. June of 2022 and we don't have mm -hmm. spotted lantern fly yet so you're doing a good job right <laughs> yeah i guess so <laughs> well so far so good although yeah. i think we all know that it's only a matter of time before it arrives to us here in yeah. kentucky it spreads fast and it's in a lot of nearby areas um so you're coming to kentucky from the university of georgia where you completed right. a master's in science of forestry and natural resources mm -hmm. and you know appreciate the work that you're doing here raising awareness about a spotted lanternfly and more so thanks for being on yeah yeah i'm happy to be here i'm gonna go ahead and share my slides yeah thank you all right well, thank you for the introduction and for having me today. Uh, just to reiterate, I'm Seth Spinner, the Spotted Lanternfly Outreach Coordinator at uh, Kentucky's Office of the State Entomologist. And today I want to talk to you all about a new pest on the horizon, the Spotted Lanternfly. So we're going to just dive right in. The Spotted Lanternfly is a plant hopper native to China and possibly Vietnam, Bangladesh, and India. Over the last 20 years, this insect has been becoming a substantial pest in places all over the world. In 2005, it was first reported outside of its natural range in South Korea, where it was causing substantial damage to grapevines. Several years later, it was found in Japan, and then in 2014, it was detected for the first time in the U.S. in Pennsylvania in 2014. This insect has become a major pest of trees, grapes, other fruits, and landscaping plants in its introduced range, causing millions to perhaps even billions of dollars in economic losses a year. Over the last nine years, this insect has been spreading throughout the mid-Atlantic states, invading New England and the Midwest, and it's likely that it will soon begin spreading into Kentucky, unfortunately. So the spotted lanternfly is a sap-feeding insect that uses a long needle-like mouth part to pierce its plant's tissues and suck out fluids. We can actually see some of the adult spotted lanternflies feeding in this picture here. So you can see this mouthpiece here. That's not its leg. That is actually its mouthpiece. Um, so... These insects are highly mobile, and both adults and uh, nymphs can jump quickly and travel several feet when disturbed. Adults are winged, and they can fly up to nearly 90 yards without having to stop to rest. However, the life history characteristic that has contributed to their spread the most is their egg-laying habits. These insects can lay their eggs on nearly any hard surface, 
So in natural environments, this would be things like trees and rocks. But outside of natural areas, they've been known to lay their eggs on things like buildings, tires, cars, children's toys, RVs, all sorts of stuff. When they lay their eggs on something like a car or an ice chest, they can be easily accidentally transported by humans and invade previously uninfested areas. Now I want to draw your attention to the pictures down here on the bottom right. So these are spotted lanternfly egg masses. On the left is a recently laid egg mass. Uh, and we can see that it's covered with this kind of light gray substance. And the females are putting that on the eggs to protect them. Now on the right, we can see some older egg masses. Over the time, um, that light gray substance will kind of wear away and expose the eggs underneath. So we can see the eggs here, and we'll also notice some have little holes in them, meaning they've already hatched and nymphs have emerged. Now, another important aspect of spotted lanternfly biology is their swarming behavior. These insects are gregarious, meaning they like to congregate together. During the day, they'll be congregating at the base of their host plant, and at night, they'll ascend the stem and congregate up in the canopy. When you're in an infested area and you find a high quality host plant, there may be dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of spotted lanternflies congregated there and feeding on that host. Here we can see the life cycle of the spotted lanternfly. These insects are univoltine, meaning they only have one generation per year. Eggs typically hatch in March, or excuse me, in May or June, and very small black nymphs with white markings emerge. You can see these um, here. So these nymphs will molt in June and then again in July, growing in size, but otherwise not really changing much visually. In the late summer, it will molt again into the final juvenile stage, which we can see on the left. These will grow to about the size of a nickel and become black and red with white markings. After acquiring the nutrients needed to fully mature, they will molt a final time and emerge as adults in the late summer and early fall. Now, the adults look noticeably different from the nymphs. They're about an inch long, and they look a little bit like moths. They have pinkish wings with black dots behind the head and a grid of black rectangular bars further back along the wings. These adults will begin mating and laying eggs in the fall and die off by the early frosts of winter. However, these eggs will survive the winter and hatch in the early summer, starting the cycle over again. Here we can see a map of counties with established spotted lanternfly populations. The red and orange counties are where established populations are known to exist. And then the yellow and the purple counties are where there have been reported sightings of this insect, but no established population is known to exist. We can also see um, that the orange and, uh, excuse me, the red and purple counties are under state and post quarantine, whereas the yellow and orange counties are not. So what that means is that no materials possibly harboring the spotted lanternfly can leave these quarantined areas without proper inspection. Now we can see from this map that the uh, insect has become pretty widespread in the mid-Atlantic states and that it's also present in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Ohio, Virginia, West Virginia, Indiana, Michigan, and North Carolina. The spotted lanternfly was first found in the U.S. in 2014 in Berks County, Pennsylvania. It's believed that they were introduced in a landscaping stone shipment from China. So we think that egg masses had been laid on some stones in China, and then they, these eggs survived the journey to the U.S. when they were shipped here. Over the next several years, the insects spread throughout Pennsylvania and the neighboring states. Now, if you fast forward to 2021, a well-established population of the spotted lanternfly was discovered in southeastern Indiana and Switzerland County. And this infestation is found just four miles north from the Ohio River. So this has been a major concern for us here in Kentucky. Due to the large reproducing population and the abundance of old egg masses, it's thought that this insect had been in Switzerland County for several years before it was first detected. The owner of this property where the infestation is actually moved from Berks County, Pennsylvania and moved his RV with him to the property. 
So we think the spot at Lanternflies in Pennsylvania had probably laid their eggs somewhere on that RV and were then transported to Indiana when he moved. Now, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources has been working to control this population using pesticides and by removing the preferred host trees. Unfortunately, last fall, an individual was found about nine miles away from this main infestation in Patriot, Indiana, which is a small community on the Ohio River right across the river from Boone County. However, fortunately, no other individuals have been found outside the primary infestation since then. Now, in 2022, we saw further expansion of the spotted lanternflies introduced range. In June of last year, North Carolina reported its first established population of this insect in the state in Forsyth County. North Carolina had been intercepting individuals in several counties uh, for the last few years, but this is the first established population found in that state. Around the same time, a new population of the insect was discovered in Huntington County, Indiana, in the northern part of the state. Then, in August, Michigan reported its first infestation of the spotted lanternfly. This was discovered in Oakland County, which is part of the Detroit metro area. More recently, a spotted lanternfly population was discovered in Cincinnati, Ohio. This infestation is pretty concerning for us here in Kentucky because it was found near railroad tracks that lead right into Kenton County, Kentucky. As I mentioned earlier, these insects can lay their eggs on really any hard surface, so that would include trains. So this could just be a very easy way for these insects to be accidentally um, introduced into Kentucky. As you can see from this map, we don't have any spotted lanternflies in Kentucky yet, at least as far as we know. But judging by the rate of spread in the Northeast and the Midwest, it's really only a matter of time before they make it into our state. So now we're going to go over some of the host plants that the spotted lanternfly attacks. The spotted lanternfly feeds on over 100 different species of plants, but today we're just going to focus on a few of the species that are important in Kentucky. So the spotted lanternfly's preferred host is the tree of heaven, which is an invasive tree from the same range in Asia as the spotted lanternfly. Though this insect prefers to feed on the tree of heaven, it will attack many different native plants as well. They've been found feeding on maples, birches, walnuts, hickories, willows, and oaks. The spotted lanternfly has also been found feeding on ashes, dogwoods, beech, yellow poplar, sycamore, and pine, such as the eastern white pine. This insect could pose yet another threat to our native ash trees after they've just been totally devastated by the emerald ash borer, another invasive insect. A major area of economic concern for the spotted lanternfly is its impacts on fruits. The spotted lanternfly has been known to feed on both domesticated and wild grapes, blackberries, and raspberries. In fact, they've become a major pest of grapes in the Northeast, where they've also been found feeding on other fruits such as cherry, apricot, apple, pear, and peach trees. So, what can these insects do to the host plants? Well, healthy established trees have not been reported to die from spotted lanternfly attacks. However, small black walnut saplings, grapevines, and tree of heaven have been known to be killed by this insect. These insects can also cause flagging and canopy dieback in older black walnuts and maples. In residential areas, these insects can become major quality of life pests. Large swarms of this pest can become a big nuisance to homeowners and to decrease the aesthetic quality of their landscaping plants. As I mentioned earlier, these insects can lay their eggs on nearly any hard surface. Um, including things like lawn furniture, patios, outdoor buildings. So this is just going to lead to even more aesthetic uh, problems for homeowners. One of the biggest quality of life issues with the spotted lanternfly relates to their feeding habits. These insects feed on sap, which has a very high sugar content. Like other sap feeders such as scale insects, they're unable to fully digest all of this sap or excuse me, all the sugar in the sap and they must excrete this excess sugar as honeydew. So these insects will excrete large quantities of honeydew all over their host plants and anything underneath them. 
we can actually see some spotted lanternflies excreting this sugary, sticky liquid in this video up here at the top. So you can kind of see occasionally some streams shooting like right there. So that's actually the honeydew. Honeydew can cause several different problems for home and business owners. It will often ferment in warm temperatures, which can lead to a very unpleasant smell. Additionally, honeydew can even pose a slipping hazard. Several people in Pennsylvania have reported slipping on honeydew covered steps and porches, sometimes even leading to broken bones. This substance can also attract stinging insects like bees and wasps, which are attracted to the smell of the honeydew. Interestingly, bees will sometimes even feed on this honeydew, and some honey producers in Pennsylvania have taken advantage of this, making a complex, smoky tasting honey with spotted lanternfly honey food, honeydew fed bees. Honeydew can also provide a great substrate for the fungus sooty mold. So sooty mold can grow on all sorts of different surfaces like mulch, plants, and wood. When this fungus establishes on honeydew covered leaves, it can actually block out sunlight and sometimes inhibit photosynthesis. In fact, vegetation under trees heavily infested by sooty, uh, the, excuse me, the spotted lanternfly have been known to die from this mold. Additionally, some homeowners in Pennsylvania have even reported that sooty mold can cause permanent staining on unpainted wooden buildings and decks. The cost of spotted lanternfly control for homeowners can be hundreds to thousands of dollars, depending on the size of their yard and the number of plants that need to be treated. Now, while I mostly focus on homeowners here, these issues can also arise in other places like businesses and parks. In addition to these issues, the spotted lanternfly can also have major economic impacts. This insect can reduce agricultural and forestry yields and disrupt horticultural and tourism operations. In Pennsylvania alone, these insects can cost hundreds of millions to possibly billions of dollars in economic damages and a loss of thousands of jobs per year to the agricultural and forestry industries. The spotted lanternfly can also have many indirect economic impacts due to the loss of income caused by the loss of jobs. The economic impacts of the spotted lanternfly will place a strain on the agricultural and forestry industries, possibly leading to layoffs. These newly unemployed people will now have less money to spend on things like groceries, gas, entertainment, etc., leading to ripple effects throughout the local economy. If the spotted lanternfly were to be introduced into Kentucky, it would likely cause substantial economic damage to our agricultural, nursery, and hardwood forestry industries. So you've heard about the impacts of this insect, but how are they managed? Well, the first step is usually going to be monitoring. This can help us know if the pest is present, give us population size estimates, and help us know which life stage the population is currently in. We can do this several ways. We could do visual surveys, which is simply inspecting host plants for signs and symptoms of spotted lanternfly infestations. However, a better option is to use some sort of monitoring device. Common tools for this include circle traps and sticky band traps. Circle traps, which can be seen in the picture on the right, right there, are probably the most commonly used spotted lanternfly monitoring tool. Circle traps are essentially bags made of window screening mesh with two small pieces of wood and some metal wire to roughly uh, shape that mesh bag into an upside down funnel. A plastic collection bag is then attached to the top of the trap and then the trap is wrapped around a tree trunk and attached with staples, thumbtacks or twine. So these traps are taking advantage of a common behavior exhibited by the spotted lanternfly. These insects often climb up the trunk of a tree until they reach the canopy, and they often will then fall back down to the ground and have to start climbing back up the tree again. Now, when you've got a circle trap set on the tree, they're going to be corralled and funneled to the top of that trap and forced into that collection bag at the top that they'll be unable to escape from. Now, another monitoring device is the sticky band trap. These traps are pretty simple. It's just a strip of insect sticky tape that is wrapped around a tree trunk. As the spotted lanternflies climb up the tree, they get stuck on the tape. We can see this in action um, in the picture on the bottom left. Now, lures aren't typically used with spotted lanternfly traps as they are used with some other insect traps, 
But there are a couple of things that are showing promise, such as wintergreen oil and leaf alcohol. Finally, a new method that is being developed is the use of spotted lanternfly sniffing dogs. So using trained dogs that are trained to sniff out and find spotted lanternflies, they're conducting surveys with these, with these dogs, but this isn't really a widespread practice yet. So we don't have any spotted lanternflies in Kentucky yet, but because of the infestations right over the border in Indiana and Ohio, the Office of the State Entomologist has been conducting surveys for this pest across the state. This map here shows where surveys were conducted in 2022. The green dots represent where I surveyed. So as you can see, my surveys focus primarily along the state line near the infestations in Cincinnati and in Indiana. I did visual surveys and set circle traps at nurseries, forests, vineyards, river ports, industrial sites, and transport related locations such as truck stops and interstate rest areas. Now the orange diamonds you can see represent where members of the public who are part of our citizen science program conducted visual surveys for the spotted lantern fly. And I'm gonna talk about that program more later. Finally, the blue squares represent where other surveyors in the office of the state entomologist conducted visual surveys uh, for this insect. Fortunately, no spotted lantern flies were found in 2022, and as of now, none have been found this year. So we can manage spotted lantern flies through physical methods as well. Some of the same tools that we use for monitoring can also be used to control populations of this pest. Circle traps and sticky band traps, along with other types of traps, can be used to capture and kill spotted lantern flies. Other, simpler methods can be used as well, such as simply squishing them by hand or capturing them by hand to kill later. If you look at that picture in the bottom left here, you'll see a water bottle filled with adult spotted lantern flies. So because these insects will commonly jump when they feel threatened, you can hold a plastic water bottle over them, and when they jump, they might end up flying up into that water bottle, which you can then seal and place in a freezer later to easily kill them. You can also easily remove spotted lanternfly egg masses by scraping them off of whatever surface they are laid on by using something like a pocket knife or um, a credit card. Though it is important to make sure that you are actually completely destroying the embryos in those egg masses, which can be done by placing them in a jar with alcohol or hand sanitizer. Now, a new method that I heard about from someone who works in New York City's public park system is the use of wireless vacuums. Using a wireless vacuum, you can suck up spotted lanternflies and capture them in the vacuum bag to kill later. This method's actually grown uh, a lot in the last year or so. I was kind of skeptical of it at first, but it's been adopted by many different agencies in the Northeast to control populations in urban areas where spraying pesticides just wouldn't really be suitable. Now we're going to discuss the pesticide management options. As of now, this is seemingly the most effective way of controlling the spotted lantern fly. We can split the pesticides used for controlling this insect into three categories, systemic, contact, and reduced toxicity pesticides. Systemic insecticides are chemicals that are absorbed by plants and then circulate throughout the plant's tissues. This is gonna provide long-term control against the spotted lanternfly and means that the insect only needs to feed on a treated host plant to receive a lethal dose rather than actually coming into direct contact with that pesticide. These pesticides are often applied through soil injections around the roots of a tree, directly into the tree trunk, or by spraying the tree trunk until it is thoroughly soaked. Systemic insecticides are the primary pesticides that are being used to control large populations of the spotted lanternfly. Now, another class of pesticides that can be used for are contact insecticides. Unlike systemic insecticides, the insects must come into direct contact with these insecticides to receive a lethal dose, such as when the in insecticide is sprayed directly onto the insect, like what's happening in the picture there. These are generally um, easier to apply, use more readily available equipment for application, and generally have pretty quick results. However, because of the way contact insecticides work, you may have to reapply these more frequently than systemic insecticides to get good results. Finally, there are also the reduced 
toxicity pesticide options. As their name implies, these insecticides are safer to humans and most animals and have less environmental impacts than other insecticides. These actually work pretty well, but they don't have any residual activity, which just means that you're going to have to reapply them frequently to get adequate control. As we can see, the spotted lanternfly is a very serious invasive pest here in the eastern U.S., but luckily for us, it has not made its way into Kentucky yet. However, that can quickly change, and it is likely that this insect will eventually spread into our state. Just in the last two years, three new states have reported established populations of this insect for the first time. The spread of the spotted lanternfly into Kentucky could have serious impacts on the state's hardwood forests, agricultural industry, nurseries, and home and business owners. However, there are ways that you can help. But we're going to go over that in a little bit. But first, I believe Dr. Crocker would like to talk to you about the spotted lanternfly's preferred host tree, the tree of heaven. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Seth. Um, and Got do it. we have any questions for Seth about spotted lanternfly before we move on to tree of heaven? You know, I think um, you mentioned this, but this time of year, you know, we're just end of June going into July. Um, people should be looking for those nymphs, right? right. Um, and we could see either of them. You could see the first instar or the second. Do you want to remind people what to look for? Right. So I think at this time of the year, you should really be keeping your eyes out for those nymphs, as Ellen mentioned, um, especially the small black ones with the white spots. Now, maybe in July, some of those ones that are black and red might begin to emerge. So that's another thing that you could start looking out for in a few weeks. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, they're going to often be congregating together, just like the adults. So that should, if you see an infestation, it should stand out pretty well. And I know we don't have any confirmed infestations in Kentucky, but there have been a few close calls and kind of um, uh, detections of dead spotted lanternfly. Do you want to talk any about that and kind of what's what what has happened in the past? Right. So I believe last year and then maybe it was 2021, two different nurseries in Kentucky received shipments from out of state that had dead spotted lanternflies um, in them. I believe one was in Bowling Green, and that was a shipment of, I think, fertilizers that had come from another nursery in Pennsylvania. And there are several dead adults shrink wrapped on that pallet. And then something very similar happened last year in Pike County, where they got a nursery, received a shipment of some supplies from somewhere in the Northeast, and there were a couple of dead spotted lanternflies wrapped in that pallet. Luckily, they were dead, though. Yes, um, and hopefully it stays that way. Um, right, you, right. Their arrival reminds us that it could be here uh, any time. Mm -hmm. Um, do we right. have any other questions for Seth? Um, we did have a question um, about what are some of the best insecticides, um, either systemic or contact, that people are using. And, you know, when it comes to insecticides or anything, you always want to check the label. The label is the exactly. law. And it's uh, also the best way to be effective and keep you and the environment safe. But do you have anything you want to share on that? Sure. So dinotephrin is a very commonly used systemic insecticide. It seems to be the best one that's been tried out so far. Um, that's actually what they are using to control those infestations in um, Indiana. As far as contact, that's usually not really used on a large scale, but bifenthrin, which I believe is um, the main ingredient in seven, um, that is a something that has proven pretty effective against those. And I believe that's used by like homeowners and infested areas to control smaller infestations in their yard. So those are two that have seemed to be pretty effective at this. Great. And then we had another question about predators <laughs> of the spotted lanternfly. What is eating spotted lanternfly? <laughs> yeah, so there actually are a few generalist predators out there that will eat this. Several birds have been noted to attack it. Um, which is a little unusual because when the spotted lanternfly is feeding on the tree of heaven, it's actually getting all these really kind of nasty tasting chemicals out of the tree. 
that is it's kind of using them as a defense mechanism. So a lot of birds, they might eat it once or twice, but after they taste it enough, they're not going to keep going back after those. Um, some praying mantises and spiders have also been known to attack them, um, but you're probably not really going to get like reliable control from, from those. One interesting thing I actually heard about in the news recently, a few days ago, though, is that they found some parasitic wasps in China in the spotted lanternfly's native range that attacks it, and they have shipped some of those over here to start doing research on those wasps to see if they would be effective control agents. But when it comes to biocontrol, you really need to make sure that this is going to be host-specific and it's not going to kill any of our native insects. So it'll probably be many years before something like that would actually be released. You know, one of the things is a lot of lookalikes. Yes. Like spot and ladder fly. At, mm -hmm. Like several, right? Like a lot of people think that it's what they have and they don't actually, thank goodness. But um, how many different lookalikes are there? So I've seen some charts online with quite a few. Um, one thing that's really commonly mistaken are different types of tiger moths. They have similar colorations. But I think the spotted lanternfly is really a pretty distinct insect. And a lot of the things that I think people are getting confused about with these lookalikes are the coloration of the hind wings of the spotted lanternfly. Those are the parts that are red and yellow and black. But usually you won't see those hind wings. Those are going to be, when they're sitting on a tree, those are going to be hidden under the, the um, four wings. So really what you, you shouldn't be looking too hard for that red and yellow coloration. You should be looking for that kind of pinkish tan with those black spots. Why do the bugs that are doing the worst damage seem to be the prettiest? I know, right? <laughs> I mean, EAB was a pretty bug. I mean, yep. you know, mm -hmm. it's, oh, it's just wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Seth. And I know you're going to talk with us in just a few minutes about mm -hmm. some ways that people can get involved. Right, right. So now Ellen's going to start talking about its preferred tree, which is Tree of Heaven. But Seth said that it doesn't sound like it likes, you know, it likes a lot of different <laughs> trees. Yep. It's not it picky. <laughs> it's not. And when uh, Seth and I have gone to visit some of the, that one of the current infestations and you know, it was on the tree of heaven, but it was also on a lot of different things. Um, yep. So I think that while it really likes tree of heaven, and if you're scouting for it, if you're looking for it, you should look for tree of heaven. Um, you could find it on a lot of different things, but I would say that you should be looking for tree of heaven anyways, because tree yeah. of heaven is an invasive plant you don't want, even if it weren't for spotted lanternfly, but especially now with spotted lanternfly coming through, it's especially important to be finding and getting rid of your tree of heaven, because they have found that areas with more tree of heaven experience greater spotted lanternfly infestations and impact. Um, so if you can get rid of your tree of heaven, it might not prevent you from getting spotted lanternfly in the future, but maybe could reduce overall what that's going to look like. How fast is it going to move through an area and how impactful is it going to be for you? All right. So um, Ellen, if you can show us what tree of heaven looks like, and I, I, I know myself, I get this mixed up with walnut trees. So you don't want to be killing walnut trees, but <laughs> so tell us the difference. Well, you know, a uh, tree of heaven is an interesting tree. Um, it is called tree of heaven, but don't be fooled by the name. It's not heavenly. It's uh, more of a headache. Um, it is a fast growing tree and it produces lots of windborne seeds. And those will blow into areas, especially disturbed areas, and take over. Um, while it is really common in urban areas, um, it can also be a problem in woodlands and in other natural areas, out competing the native species that you want to see there instead. So I'm going to introduce Tree of Heaven, what it is, what it's doing, what it looks like, and how you can manage it. So as you're scouting for spotted lanternfly, also be scouting for Tree of Heaven. 
So Tree of Heaven is also called Alanthus altissima or just Alanthus. And it's a rapidly growing early colonizing species. It can outcompete native plant species, especially on poor quality sites, because it's growing so fast. In addition, because it grows thickly, like really densely, it can become a dominant uh, canopy tree and make a dense thicket that excludes native species. Um, it's especially a problem after a disturbance, whether that is construction or uh, logging. Um, if you get tree of heaven in there, it can take over. Um, it's also thought to exude chemicals through its roots that assist in preventing the growth of other native plants. And it produces lots of those seeds that can travel on the wind and quickly invade new sites. So a little bit more about it. It is widespread in the U.S. and it tolerates a wide range of different habitats. Um, while you can see it in woodlands, it's going to really thrive uh, more than other species in poor sites along the edges and in full sun areas. Um, in Kentucky's woodlands, the biggest immediate threat is following a harvest when the arrival of Tree of Heaven can prevent the establishment of other tree species. So you want to see regeneration of seedlings to become the future dominant forest trees. And if you've got Tree of Heaven in there, you're less likely to see that. But it's also really common in urban and suburban areas. It lines many of the railroad tracks and the utility lines, um, pops up in disturbed areas, um, as you can see in this picture, even growing out of concrete. Uh, so while it prefers full sun, it can also invade those more shady spots. Um, it can grow into a very large tree. Uh, so when you're thinking of identification of Tree of Heaven and how to determine if you've got it, um, keep in mind that's going to look really differently if you're seeing some smaller seedlings or saplings versus a tall dominant tree. So, you know, it can grow into a big tree. And while those individual trees can grow tall and large in diameter, it's more common to see dense thickets of smaller diameter trees that are growing all connected to each other through their root system. So here in this picture, you can see that um, lots of those trees that are all going to be connected through their root systems. Tree of Heaven has large uh, pinnately compound leaves. So this video is showing you one leaf. It looks like lots of leaves, but those are just leaflets. Um, so a typical leaf could have many, many shaped leaflets. Those leaflets have a smooth margin. The edges are smooth. Um, and when they first emerge, they're going to be kind of a reddish color, but then those are going to develop into a dark green color on the uh, upper surface and a lighter green color on the underside. There are small lobes present at the base of each leaflet, and these are a key identifying feature of Tree of Heaven. Each lobe has a small hard bump or a gland that you can see there. And um, those are going to be distinctive and different from some native lookalikes you might mix it up with. Another really useful um, tool in identification, at least in my opinion, is the scent. Crushed leaves, broken twigs, um, cut uh, bark has a really distinctive uh, and uh, uh, unpleasant acrid burnt peanut butter smell that uh, I think you can't mistake. So the shoots of Tree of Heaven, especially of those smaller um, uh, trees, are going to be covered with lots of white lenticels, little white spots, and the leaf scars are large and triangular. The bark on those larger trees, though, is smooth and it starts out green, but it turns this gray color as it matures. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a not very distinctive bark there. The uh, tree produces kind of a light yellowy green flowers that aren't very distinctive in the summertime, but then those develop into these seeds. So here you can see a cluster of winged seeds. They have this kind of papery wing on them. Um, they can be a light green, a yellow or pink color. 
And then as those mature, they're going to turn kind of more of a papery brown color. And in the winter, those remains of the seeds can be a useful identification tool. So there are some lookalikes to Tree of Heaven. Um, a few common lookalikes are a couple native plants, uh, sumac and black walnut. Both of these species also have those compound leaves where you have one leaf, but it's made up of lots of little leaflets. Um, but their leaves are shorter. Tree of Heaven leaves can be really long, lots and lots of little leaflets, whereas both black walnut and sumac are going to have slightly smaller uh, leaves. Um, but another key distinguishing feature is that on the leaflets, the margins are going to be different. So I mentioned Tree of Heaven has this smooth edge with a little lobe at the base that has a glandular dot on it. Um, but both sumac and walnut are going to have, in this photo, you can see the teeth on the edges of sumac and walnut as well. They're not going to have as smooth edges. Another way to distinguish them is that there are also differences in the bark, in the twigs, in the leaf scars, and in the fruit here. You can see just how different those look than the uh, fruit of Tree of Heaven. So when in doubt, you can also uh, break those twigs, and the smell of Tree of Heaven is very distinctive. Um, once you know it, you won't forget it. Um, so how do we manage Tree of Heaven? Sustainable management really requires scouting for trees on or around your property and killing mature trees because those are going to be producing the seeds. And if you can prevent those from spreading, you can prevent future establishments and infestations. You don't want them competing with your native trees, especially if there's any kind of disturbance happening. In most woodlands, Tree of Heaven occurs as a few scattered trees or small groups, um, but keep your eyes peeled for them. Um, a thing that's really important to note about Tree of Heaven when we're thinking about management is that it is clonal and it will produce lots of new shoots from that same root system. So if you simply cut down a tree, um, or pull the top part and leave that root system, it's not going to be effective. You're going to get more shoots coming out of that root system. So any effective management really needs to kill that root system. Because of that, while small seedlings can be pulled, and here you can see a few in this video, um, if you can get that whole root system, that's fine. Uh, herbicide is typically a key part of management of Tree of Heaven. Um, for these small plants, foliar herbicide is commonly used. Uh, when they get a little bit bigger, you could uh, use a basal bark spray of an herbicide. And then for larger trees, a hack and squirt treatment is recommended where you cut into trees and apply a concentrated herbicide into those cuts. With Tree of Heaven, you do want to avoid approaches that might be commonly used for other plants and trees, such as the cut stump approach, um, because that's going to be less effective at moving that herbicide throughout this big root system of that tree. And you might wind up with a lot of shoots that emerge after that. After your initial management, it's really important to follow up uh, with repeated management as needed and to scout for new arrivals. You want to make sure that uh, what you tried to kill has died and nothing new is coming in. So check your woodlands for new seedlings popping up, especially after any kind of disturbance. So thanks for joining me and learning a little bit more about Tree of Heaven. Um, as you're scouting for Spotted Lanternfly, make sure you're looking for a Tree of Heaven as well. And with that, I'm going to open it up and see what questions we have. Now I know how to make sure not to get that uh, confused with a walnut tree. <laughs> well, another trick you could use for walnut is that if you cut um, a twig or a small branch uh, of walnut and tree of heaven, they're going to look really different on the inside. Walnut tend to have these chambered um, dark brown pits uh, uh, and tree of heaven would not. It would look okay. different. 
Um, so, you know, some things are a little tricky because it's like, oh, the leaves are longer in Tree of Heaven and Walnut. And like, that's great when you've got two side by side and you know what they both should look like. But it's right. not as helpful <laughs> when you just have this one and you're trying to figure it out. So we did have a comment. Someone said that they had heard, I guess it's Joro spider is Ooh. natural predator for it. Is that Seth, do you know that? Have you heard so that? I have never heard of that, but it's not too surprising. So what I know of the Joro spider is that, and like most other spiders, it's a generalist. So almost anything that flies into that spider's web, it's going to eat. And the Joro is another uh, new arrival, an mm -hmm. invasive that we don't have in Kentucky yet, uh, but further south, they've, they've been... Um, does that dealing mean we with don't that unwelcomed it? new arrival. Oh. Those actually Have you seen showed pictures up. of it? You do not want to see that. <laughs> oh. Those actually showed up to Georgia when I was living there. So I, I can attest they eat everything, oh. good huge. or bad. Yes, very big. Okay. Not good. Not good for big spiders. Okay, <laughs> don't want that. <laughs> all right. So, but you all have some things that people can do to get involved to try to track these down so that maybe Kentucky is spared from it hopefully right I mean, it probably right. won't be but you know the more <laughs> people we have the better off we are to end up getting this to happen mm -hmm. so I'm going to share my oh, oh go before ahead you do that I just want to we had a comment in the um, chat about tree of heaven management and what a challenge it is. So someone saying that they treated their trees uh, with an herbicide and then even three to five years after they were still getting uh, new shoots emerging from the root system. And that is really accurate. Um, the, the root system of tree of heaven is extensive and it is harder to kill that. Uh, you can kill the above ground portion and you'll still have pockets that weren't impacted by that. Um, so just want to reiterate, um, and thanks for the comment, the importance of follow-up, not only to make sure that what you did killed everything, but you're not going to get a bunch of new shoots emerging. And then the other thing is that if you had Tree of Heaven there to begin with, there's probably some seed source around there. There's probably some seed bank still there. So new emergences as well. So for all of those reasons, um, invasive plant management is never something that you can do once and be like, okay, I'm all done. I did it. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be something that's got to be repeated regularly. The good news is that it's never going to be as bad once you've done you know, it once. Um, you can do a little bit, a little bit of monitoring, a little bit of management, and it should get easier and easier. But there are lots of other invasive plants that would be delighted to move in once you've <laughs> moved out one of them. So in addition to looking for a new tree of heaven, looking for other invasives that would be happy to come in and fill that niche. That's not what you want. You want those native species that are going to add to the value, to the diversity of your stand. Great. Great. So back to you, Seth. Yeah. Tough plant to manage. All right. So as I mentioned earlier, there are a few ways that you can help us to keep the spotted lanternfly and other invasives uh, out of our state, or at least help us manage them. So first, if you travel to an area that has a known spotted lanternfly infestation, it is very important that you inspect your belongings for spotted lanternflies before returning to Kentucky. This includes vehicles, ice chests, camping equipment, outdoor furniture, really just anything that the spotted lanternfly can lay its eggs on or hide in. Another important thing to remember is to not move firewood. Burn it where you buy it. This can help prevent many different invasive insects and plant diseases from being spread to new areas. Now, I bet many of y'all listening have uh, heard of the emerald ash borer. This insect was spread a lot through people moving firewood long distances. Now, if you think you found the spotted lanternfly here in Kentucky, you can report that directly to the Office of the State Entomologist. We have an invasive species reporting email address report a pest at uky.edu. And you can see that there in the bottom left corner of the slide. <clears throat> so if you believe that you have found the spotted lanternfly, you can take a photo of it and send that photo along with the location of the report of the sighting 
to this email address and the office of the state entomologist will check out your report to verify it. Uh, I'd also like to mention the iNaturalist group that I've created for Tree of Heaven reporting in Kentucky. If you haven't heard of iNaturalist, it's, it's just a website and mobile app used by amateur naturalists and researchers alike to identify, report, and record sightings of all sorts of different plants and animals, both native and invasive. So anytime you report Tree of Heaven in Kentucky on iNaturalist, that report is going to automatically be added to my group. Then that data from your iNaturalist report is going to be automatically uploaded, uploaded into a map that I've created that shows locations of Tree of Heaven around Kentucky. This map is also compiling reports for many other sources like the U.S. Forest Service's Forest Inventory Analysis National Program, the Office of the State Entomologist's Survey Database, and EdMaps, which is a website that researchers use to report invasive species. And this can be found on the Office of the State Entomologist's website. However, if you really want to help in monitor invasive species, the Office of the State Entomologist has a new program that we're inviting any interested Kentucky resident to join. So the Office of the State Entomologist, in collaboration with UK's Entomology Extension Specialists, have started a citizen science program. This program is open to anyone living in Kentucky who wants to collaborate with our office to help protect Kentucky's agriculture, natural resources, and native ecosystems. Through this program, our citizen scientists collect real pest monitoring data to assist the Office of the State Entomologist in mitigating the harmful impacts of invasive species. When it comes to invasive species management, early detection of the pest is key. If new infestations are noticed quickly enough, they can be controlled before the infestation gets out of hand and spreads further into the state. Our office has limited personnel and we can only be in one place at a time. So having more boots on the ground looking for these pests is a tremendous help with early detection. Additionally, the data that our citizen scientists collect goes beyond just Kentucky. This data is also used by the USDA to inform policy and regulatory decision making regarding invasive species. This is our second year of doing the program and uh, it's been very successful so far. This year we've had over 130 individuals sign up and several uh, organizations are also, also participating, such as the US Forest Service, the Kentucky Office of State Nature Preserves, Cub Scouts, 4-H, Master Gardeners, in several county and city managed parks. If you'd like to join our group of citizen scientists, there are several different ways that you can contribute. Our citizen scientists have the option of doing one or more of the following. They can conduct visual surveys, which is essentially just spending time outside looking for the pest, for the spotted lanternfly, tree of heaven, and for another important invasive species, the imported fire ant. They can also have the option of trapping the spongy moth, which is an invasive moth that can defoliate oak trees. And the trap for this insect can be seen to the left of it. Um, now, unfortunately for 2023, it is too late to start spongy moth trapping, but you can still sign up to conduct visual surveys for the other pests this year. So if you're interested in participating in the citizen science program, you can scan the QR code here or visit that URL below it. Uh, and this will take you to the Office of the State Entomologist website. And from there, you simply click on pest surveys at the top of the page. And that will take you to our surveys page where you can find more information on the citizen science program and the application to join. Uh, I hope some of our viewers today are interested and want to sign up. Uh, that's all I've really got for the uh, part about how you can help. Wonderful. Thank you. So we did have a couple of questions and there was one slide that you showed that had the email address on it and right. um, they wanted to know if they could possibly just use that as a Facebook post to spread the word for you. Yeah, you. absolutely. So, that would be great. I yeah, would so. appreciate that. <laughs> I think we can do that and get that to that person. And yeah. um, evident, one of our uh, viewers goes to Pennsylvania. So she's wondering, should she go to the car, through the car wash 
to make sure she's not bringing any lantern flies home with her or what's the best avenue to well you know that that could possibly help um one thing it seems like it is common is this is a big problem with commercial truckers you really need to check like your wheel wells kind of underneath the car too because that's a common hiding spot um and you know some car washes might not really be effectively getting down there so a car wash probably would help, but you would still need to do a little bit more inspection. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I think that's the only questions that we have. So um, Dr. Crocker, El or Ellen and Seth, thank you so much for joining us today. You know, it was Absolutely. a great amount of information and I'm sure it's a lot that we will be able to utilize on down the road too. Hopefully we won't have to, <laughs> but you know, at least that way um, we, we have it and we know um, what to look for. So um, thank you both for joining us. We greatly appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for, for having us on. And I thanks, hope to not have to have an update. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> Normally I'll say, hey, we'll have you back on, but I don't want you back on for an update for that. You can yep, talk about yep. something else. Well, <laughs> this spring we'll come back. Next spring we'll come back and we'll talk about how to look for and squish egg masses. Yeah. Um, you know, now <laughs> you can still see egg masses this time of year, but now's really the time to be looking for those nymphs. Mm -hmm. um, and then later the adults. But through the winter, you can look for the egg mass to, masses of the spotted lanternfly. And Seth and I got out and squished a bunch uh, this this winter. Uh, so mm -hmm. we'll show you how that works. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And is it the ALB? It kind of looks like that, right? I mean, it's got the, the black and the spots. It does have spots. I think but the Asian be... longhorn beetle looks pretty different. Pretty um, different, okay. But, you know, then again, uh, maybe that's in the eye of the beholder. I was just wondering <laughs> if people could get them mixed up as well. I don't think you'd mix the two Probably up. Not. But they do okay. both have spots. So so look yep. for spots. Yep. <laughs> Black and white spots. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. All right, you know, um, we had a wonderful show today and, you know, I greatly appreciate everybody joining us and because one, we couldn't do it without you. So we appreciate you being here each and every Wednesday with us. And um, if you have any questions whatsoever about what you heard today, or if you have a topic for an idea, go to fromthewoodstoday.com. We have a little survey there that you can fill out and um, take that. And you can also send us pictures. So if you happen to see something in the woods that you would like me to get to Seth or Dr. Crocker, you can just email that. And um, we can hopefully tell you that you did not see it. But um, if you did um, happen to see spot or lantern fly, make sure to send us a photo to make sure that uh, they can ID it correctly and see if, um, see if they need to come to your neck of the woods. So we greatly appreciate you joining us and we will see you next week at 11 o'clock. Take care. Bye. From the woods today.